fun fact, <laughs> guilty, but fun fact, I did some research, and did you know that 42% of Americans, <clears throat> now this doesn't include you guys, <clears throat> not at all, but 42% of Americans spend about $720 a year on forgotten apps. You say, no way. That's not me. I know I don't do it. <clears throat> Check it. 40, well, let's divide. Let's do 42%. 42%. And you say, how did we get into that? You took something for free. And then it cost you. You were sitting in the airport and you wanted to watch a football game. And you're like, oh, I need, oh, oh, and you downloaded ESPN Live and it was free for 30 days and you enjoyed the game and then you forgot about it. And they're charging you $3.99 a month. Come on. There's a catch, right? And when we give gifts... We're leery in our society. We're suspicious because there's got to be a catch. Because now you're going to go home and check your credit card statement, ain't you? You're already doing it. Put your phone down. <laughs> I'm not going to charge you today. So when we approach the fact of giving a gift, why is it that we're suspicious, like, whoa? Right? That, you can't do that to me. Like, don't give that to me because now I know there's a catch. I like it best when you give me something and you tell me, open it. Open it now. Like, I don't want to. Like, that is the worst thing in the world for me. Like, how am I supposed to respond? Like, I don't know what it is, and so am I supposed to be happy? Am I supposed to be like, whoa? Am I, what, what am I supposed to do when you give me that? And don't, so don't do that to me. I want to go into the confinement of my room, really, and sit there by myself and like, huh. And if I want to return it tomorrow, I don't want you to know it. It was funny. Very, very thoughtful. I got to say this. I wasn't going to say that. Lord, do I say this? Yeah. I came into my office here a while back, and I had mentioned that I, if I ever bought a kicker jersey, it would be the Cleveland Browns because he did so well. And somebody bought me a Cleveland Browns kicker jersey. Thank you very much. But I have no idea when I'm going to wear it. Maybe, maybe to preach? If they make it to the Super Bowl, I'll wear it. Here, uh, is that cool? Thank you. But like, I know whoever gave it is like watching. Like, when's he gonna wear that thing? Isn't that how we do? There's an ulterior motive behind our giving, isn't there? I gave up hunting this morning to come tell you. It's a joke, okay, give it up that there is a gift available that has no, there's no catch to it. There's no ulterior motive. And this past week, some things have happened in my life that really, really wrecked my theology of how I was raised. And I think some of you will probably, uh, it'll resonate with you as well. And I'm just going to be, I don't know that I'll go too much by notes today, if that's okay. I'm just going to speak from my heart, what God has laid on my heart about giving. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to uh, give those gifts to those people who need them. And it was just a good feeling to be here and realize that there's no catch here. They didn't have to sign up and then get an email every day with a new promotion from Light in the Valley. Like, 
you know what I mean? Like it was just here. We want to help. That felt good because so many times in our society, we get it mixed up. How about this one? Uh, I give you something like a cookie and then you say, wow, thank you. And then when you come to give me something back, it's pie. And now, now the pie was great, but now we got to one up that. And so next time I give something, hey, you guys want to go out to eat? And, and, and it escalates. It's the cycle of, I got to give better. Uh, <laughs> I got to outdo him, right? We have that mentality sometimes, don't we, about giving? I want to talk to you about something that is not like that this morning. The gift of God isn't clothes, and it isn't jewelry. It's not a warm feeling. It's not the stars in the skies or even the oceans or the planet that we live in. The gift of God is himself, and there is no expectation in return. He wants it. He wants it. But he's not expecting it, and I've got scripture to prove it. So this morning, what makes a gift a gift according to Jesus Christ himself? We're going to study that a little bit this morning and dive into some scripture here in a little bit of what it means, what is a gift? What makes a gift a gift? And we're going to go according to Jesus Christ himself. Because I believe as a culture, and I believe you would agree with me after we went through the scenarios of the different gifts that you've given or, or taken, right? We have sort of lost the definition of what a true gift actually is. Some of you already have went to Christmas parties this year. How many have went to Christmas parties this year already? I have. Am I the only one? Seriously. All right. So uh, you know this. If you went and there was a white elephant game involved, that you, in order for you to even show up, you have to have a gift because you're going to receive one, right? You would never go to one of those Christmas parties without something because you're going to get something. So in order for you to be receiving one, you better be giving one. Or they're going to look at you odd. And so when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I've got a gift for you, you're like, eh. Why do we put our guard up? What's it going to cost me? It's even rolled over into the church. There's people who are probably sitting here right now saying, oh, I know what he's going to say. Jesus is the ultimate gift, but it's going to cost me everything. Right? You know what I'm going to say today, right? You could almost come up here and do it. But if you read scripture and take it literally for what it says, I challenge you to think about this, that the gift it's free. It's free. There's no stipulation, no regulation, no expectation of it coming back. You say, but if, if I give my heart to Jesus, then he's going to require moral standards, higher moral standards. He's going to require much more holiness and endless amounts of worship. And you're seeing all of that. and You're saying, that's not me, right? Because there seems to be a catch to everything. You sign up for free, then there's a catch. What does a gift really mean? It has no catch. Are you ready? What makes a gift a gift according to Jesus? The number one, if you want to write this down, you can. The giver, Jesus, is the initiator. He is the one that gives first. He gives it. It's just a gift. Oftentimes, you know, we, we receive gifts in our society because we deserve it or we're likable or we're born into the correct family or there, there's just this, we're, we're in the right circles, right? Or somebody gives us a gift because of who we are. No matter your background, no matter your portfolio, no matter your records, no matter what you've done with your life or no matter what you've not done with your life, right? Here's the good news. That's for you. 
there is a gift prepared for you. You don't have to have that type of standard. And whether you acknowledge this gift, whether you recognize this gift, whether you have asked for it or whether you've desired it, it has been prepared for you. First John chapter 4, verse 10, if you'll put it up there. It says this, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What does propitiation mean? mean that's a big big word it means that he took our place he took the judgment of our sins upon him instead of us it says in this is love now i grew up in a very strict uh uh conservative church and i heard preachers and my uh, i was a preacher's son so i was forced to listen to it But I have this different mentality, I think, than some, and it's like, and here's where my theology gets wrecked a little bit, but I grew up listening to, uh, you have to conform to this and be this so that God can love you. Instead of the fact that just simply stating God loves you. All of the, the things, the holiness and, and all of the, the uh, maturity in your spiritual life will come eventually. But the way I was raised, we try to channel it in and then and force it on you. And then you'll love God. When in reality, my heart was never really that softened by that. It was actually hardened by that. Am I, am I making sense? And so I wonder if we wouldn't be more effective by telling people the absolute magnitude and the, just the whole passionate love of God. Because in this verse, you'll leave that up there, in this is love. Not that we have loved God. Not that we've loved God. But that he loved us. No matter what status we are in, he loves us. You might meet somebody who says, I don't believe in God. Yeah, but he loves you. That should be our answer as Christians. Passionate about Christ, passionate about the gospel, that should be our answer. Not, not hey, you come to our church and you start, uh, you start cleaning up and you start doing this, you start doing this, and, and, and then, you know, God, God will love you. You might meet somebody who says, I hate God. I've met those people. Yeah, but I, my answer to them is, but he loves you. You can't get away from it. It's the best gift that he's ever given. It's the best gift that you can ever receive. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's simply saying that God was not moved and is not moved by our love for him. He, he loves us. It's who he is. It's what he does. He can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. I remember when I was younger, I, I, I made this deal. I was like, God, you know what? I'm getting ready now to serve you, and I'm going to give my heart to you, but there was a negotiation there. If you give me a beautiful brunette wife, <laughs> I'm making it sound like it all came true. You know what I mean? Then I'll serve you. That's not God. He doesn't, he doesn't operate that way. We can't work our way into it. He loves us. And he initiates it. He just gives it. In other words, he just he gives it. Not everybody will receive it, but it is for everyone. That is something that needs to be very, very plain this morning. It is for everyone. 
in this love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. So the first one is the giver initiates. Number two, reason that a gift becomes a gift, according to Jesus, is the giver intends only to give. That's his intention from the beginning. We don't understand that because when we give something, most, most times we're like, oh, yeah, you know, cast your bread upon the water and many days it'll return. Like, we're using that as like, oh, yeah, we're going to be blessed, right? But he intends, the giver intends only to give. I don't want to intimidate you, but there is a scripture that I have memorized. And it goes like this in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. You know that one? Oh, you know it too. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, somebody say believes, believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I'm going to read it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever Let's, I looked that word up. Do you know what whoever means? Whoever. It means whoever. Whoever. And me and you, in, in the way, I, mean, I shouldn't say me and you. Me, the way I was raised, is not whoever. But it is whoever. Say whoever. Do you believe that this morning? Whoever. You're sitting beside people right now that you can't believe it, that it would be for them. It's for whoever. It blows our mind. It is what it is. So God gave his only son for whoever. Whoever. Say it however you want, with any type of enunciation you want. Whoever. Whoever, whoever. That means you, Tommy. That means you, Becky. Arlen. Whoever. I'm going to tell you right now, there's few things very, very precious to me, but there's one thing that is very, very precious to me, and that is my beautiful wife and my three children. I take it serious. You look at them wrong once and see what I'll do. They are precious to me. And if you asked for any one of those four human beings, <laughs> I guarantee you one thing. You better have some honor. You better have respect. And you better love them like I did. Now, I only got one daughter. I don't know how this is going to go. She's 17, so she'll probably be 45 or 50 before she gets married. But that's good. Because I don't know how that's going to go. Whoever it is, whoever it is, Or should it just be whoever? Larry, I had to think of you. You've got four girls. Whew, God bless you. How did that? I, 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 we don't have all day, but I get you up here and tell us how it went. Whoever. He, Larry's like, whoever. I guarantee you not. But that's what God did with his only son. Whoever. Imagine that. For God so loved the world. What is the world? It's the sinful, broken system that you and I are actually classified under and in and part of. That's who he gave his only son to. Whoever. And then we sit here with our religion and say, <clears throat> yeah, but. You need to do this first. And God said, no, whoever. 
I want that to stick in your mind because I'm going to say it a couple more times before I leave here. God gave his son to a people with a guarantee of whoever. Which tells me that God I serve is a God of love. It is who he is and it is what he does. And you can't change it. His love doesn't expect anything in return. It's just who he is. And we make a big deal about it. And we make standards around it. It's not our job to do that. The giver intends to give no matter what the response. That's why he sent his son for whoever. And we get caught up in thinking, I know I grew up this way, and you know what? Just this week, it, it came to me again, and I sat and I cried. I was so emotional this week, it was, and I'll probably get emotional. I hope I can get through this. But it came to my thoughts again. God showed me in such a clear way that it doesn't matter where we're at in our life, he is never going to stop loving us. He will not stop loving you. You can think and, and think, I went too far. This, this young girl that I'm supposed to meet with tomorrow, she feels like she's went too far and she can't return to God. And I just text her mom and I said, just please tell her that God loves her so much. You can't run from it. There's a verse in Psalm 139, 8. It ends this way. David wrote this. He says, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. It gives me the idea that he actually thought there is no way. And if you read Psalm 139, there's a bunch of those parallels that, and comparisons that he makes. But that's a pretty blatant one, is it not? You can't get away from it. God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And that word is true. He never stops loving you no matter what. When God gives a gift, he intends to give it with no strings attached. He just gives it. What makes a gift a gift? According to Jesus, the giver initiates the gift. The giver intends only to give it. And lastly, the giver gives himself. My keyboard player is sick this morning. <laughs> we won't even go there, okay? I know what he was up to this morning. Not the keyboard player, the enemy. Brennan, would you come play some keys? Just play some keys. That's all I want. The giver gives himself in John chapter 15, verse 13, it says this. And we take this verse so many times. We're like, oh, yeah, that is my life verse. And I use that with my friends. And I would give my life for my friends. It says that greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Greater love. In fact, God is saying that's the actual greatest love that you could possibly have is to lay your that's on, uh, is that not up there, John 15, 13? Yep, there you go. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. I'll let you have that verse, but I want you to bring it back and put it in where it belongs because that verse, it's not so much about you, it's, it's for Jesus. God allowed that to be written for Jesus in reference to what he gave to you and to me. <laughs> we make it so complicated. We make it complicated. And anymore I see to study scripture and to read and to, we're in an information age. It's right at the tip of our fingers. Anything that we want we can we can download it, we can research it, we can, we can get it, right? Google is king. So you have more and more people who aren't really believing the first five books of the Old Testament. Those, did those incidents actually happen? There's more doubt. 
There's more confusion around Scripture today than there has been ever. So I'm going to give you my rendition of Christmas, if that's okay. Y'all still with me? I was telling somebody yesterday, there's only so many ways you can preach Christmas. Story is what it is. But it never gets old to preach about Jesus. If you start in the Gospels, you'll read the story of where a little baby was born. He was born to a stepdad and a young virgin mother. Virgin. Maybe that's why some people don't believe it. That's what my Bible says. And he was born and placed in a manger. We have the nativity up here. And we, we kind of cluttered it, didn't we? All of them are in there. The wise men, the shepherds, the angels, the sheep. And it says, my scripture tells me that the shepherds were the first ones to come. Now, the other night we had a live nativity parade out in Berlin. And it's not hard to find volunteers to be shepherds. But I will tell you back then, shepherds were low lowlifes. Me and Becky got to spend a whole day with them in Jordan running sheep and goats through the mountains. Believe me, they're low lives. Shouldn't say that, but I mean, they literally got in a fist fight. There was blood spurting out of the one dude's nose right in front of us. These guys are classless, if I may say. And they were the first ones to come and visit this baby. And then it says the wise men came, but what we... And we, we don't even, December 25th works, right? But I'm gonna, I don't know that that's the correct date. It could have been in August. We don't know that. But we believe and we honor the 25th. Y'all right with the 25th? Did anybody celebrate in August? But the wise men were about two to three years behind the shepherds. So, hey, last night I saw a newborn baby who was three weeks old. I can actually wrap my brain around the fact of possibly worshiping a cute little baby like that. But go back to the nursery and pick out a two-year-old you want to worship. Ha, <laughs> sorry, there's none of them back there that you would. And yet the wise men come and they want to visit. They knock on the door. Joseph opens the door. He said, hey, we're here to see baby Jesus. He said, oh, he's got a poopy diaper. I'll be, well, let's change that. We'll be right back. That was the age. They gave him gifts. And then you see him later on in life. You see at 12 years old, he's in the temple, and he's actually teaching his gospel message to the Pharisees and, and, and to the scribes and Pharisees there and the leaders of the temple. And then what's interesting to me is that was, that's Christmas, right? But what's interesting to me is you don't read about him anymore until he's 30 years old. And in the three years that are recorded here, three years, your gift's in there, my gift's in there. And we receive it. This week I was reminded of just how religious I can be sometimes. Had a young couple having some problems. I don't know them very well. And so... My wife and I sat down with him. And all of this stuff started coming out. Trash. Junk. Show up, throw up. Ugh, like that. 
right there. And then I said, so how long have you guys been married? Oh, we're not married. My religion rose up in me. I'm like, well, why are you here? I didn't say that, but you got to work with me here. I'm human. And all of a sudden, I felt God's presence. And he said to me, I heard it as plain as day, Jimmy, my love for these two, look at them. Aren't they beautiful? And they are. But my love for these two is just as close to them as it is to you. That'll wreck your theology. It did me. Am I making sense? We can't help you till you get married. That would be that would be what we would normally say, huh? And then you look at Jesus' life as he's hanging on the cross. He is not even supposed to be there. He has done nothing wrong. He has lived a perfect life. And yet this was God's intention of bringing him down here and having two criminals, one on either side. And we look at those criminals and we think, boy, that one sure was brass. He did he made the statement, said, boy, if you're God, if you are sent from God, why don't you get off the cross and help us? And there he is. He's in the middle. So as I was sitting in my office, I thought, Jesus is in the middle. He's in the middle of their mess. And they don't even know it. And my heart broke. And I want you to pray for them. I have a strong hunch, a strong hunch that they will become saved. And I have an even stronger hunch that they will attend here one day. And I have even a stronger hunch that God is going to use their situation in a powerful, mighty way. The same way he did me and the same way he's using you. He wants to use us. But we got to receive the gift that's in the middle. I want the one in the middle. can't explain that away. Then my theology was also wrecked when I thought December 19th of 21 last year, you guys all prayed for me and Becky as we left this place and we went and found my brother. Remember? One person. Sweet missing for 10 years, off the grid for 10 years. And when I found him, he had hair down to here, beard down to here. Uh, no big beards here today. Good. Not trying to be judgmental. And I remember so well that when I sat at McDonald's in Canton and for the first time that I've seen him now in 10 years, I remember so well what God impressed on my heart that day. Your brother's not any farther away from my love than you are. People ask me all the time, does he go to church? Nope. Not yet. Does church save us? Is that a requirement for God to love us?
Are you here this morning so God loves you? It's reverse from what we think. Sign up for free, it's going to cost us everything, right? He loves us, and he loves you so passionately. And I guess I'm going to come off my little hobby horse, and my message is going to be that God loves you dearly. And that gift, you can't one-up that. You can't. I received a gift this week that I can't one-up. Hardest thing in the world for me to receive. A friend of mine said, get over yourself. God's not done knocking the pride out of your life, I guess. Whew. That's earthly. This gift, you can't one up. The only thing that he would so desire from you is a life that reflects his love. Is that too much to ask? But even if you choose not to, even if you choose not to, he still loves you. It's a powerful verse that David says. If I make my bed in hell, you will be there with me. That's as far away from God as you can get. And David recognized it. So many times we have these thoughts of how it should look. And he wrecks that theology every single time. John 3.16, put it back up there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes, that word believes, that's like you receiving a gift for Christmas and opening it. That's what that means. It's that simple. It's that simple. And we should be just as excited, even more, to open that as we are at Christmas time. We have, my wife is, she's on it. She's on top of things. Every Christmas gift has been wrapped and under the tree for about a week and a half, two weeks now. <laughs> and every year, she has this little code that she uses to, so, I mean, once you wrap them, once you get to 45, right? Once we're over 45, we can't remember what box has what, so we gotta mark them. So she used the number system. And over the years, our kids have become pretty wise to this system and they can figure it out. Oh, number three is for her and him, you know, that, that type of thing. The other day, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, I don't pay that close attention to it. The other day I was there, and here comes Mason. Dad! I said, what? Dad, you won't believe this. I said, what? He said, the gifts under the tree, they all have a name on it. Like, they have our names on it. And Becky's in the background winking at me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's code. I said, well, what's wrong with that? Well, I only have one. <laughs> it's free. This gift is free. 